So today's, today's talk is consciousness and self-discovery. And what do these two things have to do with each other? Uh, are they connected in some way? And we're going to be asking some questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Uh, maybe some other questions too as we go along, depending on what questions you have too. It is only as we look into ourselves and as we look into consciousness do we find that we can't study one without studying the other. And it doesn't matter which way we're approaching it, we find that eventually it all meets. And we enter into that many different natures and cultures and call the great mystery. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So what is consciousness? It's actually a fundamental aspect of the universe. Unfortunately, in Western civilization where we live, this culture has a very narrow view of consciousness. Humans have it to a certain extent, and maybe other creatures have a little bit of it. But if they can recognize themselves in a mirror, then they're conscious. Well, really. Talk about the species-centric view of consciousness. It's not even relatable to if any of you have done even uh, the slightest bit of work on yourself and understanding what you are, who you are, and what consciousness is about. So if we can work with the premise that consciousness is a fundamental aspect of the entire universe, does that be okay for everybody this afternoon? That it is not just species-centric to human beings, that it is something that is potentially, because we don't know, we can't prove it, but we also can't disprove it. So for now, we're just going to leave it really open. Maybe it is a fundamental aspect. Now this is something that, as we go along, we find that um, in all ways, everything that we explore will relate to our level of consciousness. And without consciousness, we don't exist. Without consciousness, we have no human experience, no spiritual experience, no experience at all. So consciousness, intention, and awareness are somehow connected. Now, I can't quite read that over there, so I am going to have to work a little bit from my notes here. And, um, Now, let's look at the human being for a few minutes. Okay, we have a human body, right? In this lifetime, right, we're human. Everybody in this room so far is human. And we all agree that we have a brain. Now, unfortunately, in our, again, in our culture and in our way of thinking these last few hundred years, medicine and science has been focusing on that consciousness is a product of the brain which is as silly as thinking that the computer is the source of all the material in it, or the television is the source of all the TV programs. It's just not. It is the medium through which, for the computer, all that information moves, and the television is the medium or the channel for which all of those uh, wonderful, entertaining, um, informative uh, TV shows stream through, but it's never the source. So we have a choice this afternoon. We can either see our human body and our brain as being the source of consciousness, or we can see it as being the channel of consciousness, and that consciousness is not contained in our brain the way this water is contained in this glass. Are we good so far? We're, yeah, we're good? We can keep going with this? Great. So consciousness could be then something that we experience through how oh, it permeates. It's not just in our brain where the thinking takes place. Um, it was only just over halfway through the last century that they actually were able to find that neurotransmitters exist not just in our brain, which is where they thought they were, but through our entire system and a large collection of them in our lower digestive system, and they couldn't figure out why are they there. But a study of the energetic body will say, well, of course they're there, because that's where we hold all our instincts. 
if you understand the chakra system, you'll see that our energy body works through these chakras, which are throughout our body. And so it must be that these things are not contained, somehow permeating through it. So we're good so far? We can keep going, yes? Now, what's wonderful in this last few decades? Well, increasingly, if we go back to perhaps the great British biologist Lyle Watson at the turn of the century, the last century, former one, and the work that uh, the biologists were doing as they were creeping along on the frontier and the edge of their science, and they were discovering things that they just couldn't quite, they didn't have an answer for. And now with more modern technology and people uh, standing on the shoulders of the people before them, taking work that's been done and bringing it forward, <clears throat> what we're finding is in so many fields, modern science is aligning with ancient traditions and spiritual teachings, that somehow they are meeting together. So what modern science is saying is confirming things. The spiritual teachers in all paths, shamans, old world cultures, aboriginal uh, cultures, spiritual traditions have been saying all along that we're, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're interconnected, that there's something that dynamically interconnects all of us that we don't quite understand, that we can give lots of names to and have a language around or images around, but in the end remains the great mystery. So it's rather exciting if we look at all of the fields. We have quantum physics, astrophysics, uh, modern biology, medicine, epigenetics, um, <coughs> All of these wonderful science. Uh, people in the room, are you studying any of those? Some of you students, you're in your neuroscience classes or your biology classes, or you have been. And so you know what I'm talking about. Everything is creeping forward, and all of a sudden you find a, a meeting with exactly what the physicists are saying is confirming what the biologists are saying. Quantum mechanics is confirming exactly what's being said in epigenetics. And so it's extraordinary. So we find that the micro-universe and the macro-universe, the micro-universe being what we discovered through the microscope, going down further and further and further as the microscopes have advanced in technology, to be able to help us to see and understand uh, what lies deeply uh, at the core of matter. At the same time, the macrocosmos in them would be things like um, the very large telescopes, the VLT telescopes, the Hubble telescope, are taking us into the macrocosmos where we can see things that we are not able to see, haven't been able to see, that other through the centuries and maybe millennia that what we would now call scientists and, and scientists and, and researchers then were also mystics and teachers in their own right. They were guessing at them and hinting at them, the movements of all of these things. We can look and see that in ancient medicines, they were talking about a life force moving through the body. And they were talking about movements of the planets and guessing that things were happening in the stars and in the cosmos that are now being confirmed. So the extraordinary thing about consciousness is right now you're conscious, we are together, we're having this consensual reality experience of being in this, I must say it's one of the rather more interesting venues that I've spoken in. Uh, usually they're much more, let's say, academic. So it's adding a certain kind of funky flavor to um, the ambiance. Um, so let's relax and enjoy it, right? Um, but the bottom line is, right now we're in this consensual reality experience. We're all here together in this moment. And what are we experiencing together? We're experiencing something that we're hearing through our ears and seeing through our eyes and sensing through the rest of our body. And if we take that one step deeper, we'll see that what we are doing is our consciousness is sitting through intention and awareness. And, and, and we are screening everything through our body with its senses, which are filtering mechanisms. Our body has the ability 
to hear only a certain range. For example, we can't hear what a dog can hear or a cat can hear. Anybody got cats? Can, can, can we agree? Anybody got dogs? It's a cat room. <laughs> so if you have cats or dogs, even birds hear things we don't hear, right? Everything hears things we don't hear. Can, can we all agree that they hear things we don't hear? They sense things that we don't sense. Okay, we think they're just doing something that will. But right now, the earth is making a very loud noise, but it's below our ability to hear. We have a decibel range. Above that, below that, we don't hear it. We can't see what a snake sees, or a hawk, or a million other creatures. Because our vision is designed for our survival, so we see in a range. Now, if we're hearing in a range, and we're seeing in a range, and we're sensing in a range, because imagine if we could see and smell and hear and sense everything, it would be overwhelming, incoming stimuli. We wouldn't be able to cope, see like a hawk, smell like a no, it's, we couldn't, we couldn't cope too much. We couldn't sift out what we need for our survival. So through the millennia, the multi-multi-millennia, the human species has developed like every other species on the planet for our own individual survival. Now that doesn't mean that it's not happening. All those sounds and smells and sights and things are here, they're around us. Is this empty space here? Is this but it's nothing in it. What's in it? What's in it? Waves and waves of information. Let's not even talk about the phones and all the technology. We're in a soup of, of waves, from microwaves to macrowaves to everything is all moving. Reruns of I Love Lucy and MASH, it's all running through this room at the same time that non-human things are moving through the room at the same time. We just can't sense it. Okay, so where am I going with all of this? Are you starting to ask some of those questions? Who am I then? Am I just a human with a body that's a filtering mechanism? Is, is that what I am? Well, yeah, that's partly, partly what we all are having this human experience. Recent information teaches us that we're probably by weight, we're, we're more foreign species than what we think is human. Um, if we start counting all of the bacteria that lives inside of us that we need, it's symbiotic, don't get creeped out and go into a colonic or something, you don't need it. Uh, we actually need these, all of these little microscopic symbiotic creatures uh, that we cohabit with. Uh, they keep us healthy, they keep us in balance, and they're, they're working with us. And so there's so many, in so many ways, being what is human, and then we're going to look deeper than that as we go along, but we're just sort of starting with the body for a moment. Okay. So. One more thought on this, which is, uh, Researchers in anthropology and ethnobotany are bringing together some ancient teachings which are, again, in a different language and coming from a different level of experience but being put into the mix with modern science and other ancient spiritual traditions. They are adding something profoundly interesting into the inner exploration. They are showing us that inner exploration has been around for hundreds of thousands of years. It is not something developed in the last century. It's been around for a very, very long time. But not only have we had this inquiry of who am I and why am I here, and I don't mean why am I here in this room, I mean why am I here on planet Earth in physical matter reality, right? You ever ask yourself those questions? What's the meaning of the universe? What's the meaning of life? These are existential questions that everybody asks. There isn't anybody in this room who has not asked those questions of themselves 
whether or not you took philosophy classes in C. Sheffield University or what have you, out of your own interest, you will have asked these questions because we all ask them. They are innate existential questions that we search for. Now what fascinates me is the preoccupation with where do we go when we leave here? If you notice, most great religions and spiritual traditions teach us how to prepare for that. They, they give us beautiful uh, spiritual traditional stories and uh, lives of saints and great teachers and masters to meditate on. All about, you know, heading towards Omega, as Kenneth Ring, Dr. Kenneth Ring beautifully put it. We're all heading towards Omega. Uh, alpha being, being the beginning and Omega being the end. And, and for sure, this is a key question that we all need to ask ourselves. Personally, I've always been more interested in where was I before I was here? And don't tell me I was a child in my father's eye, okay, or some of those other things that we get told. Where was I before I was here? And you get told these cute stories about, about you know, um, coming onto the planet, and, and, and that has its place. This entire, what was my existence before I was in this lifetime? So further along the road, we're gonna take a little bit of a look at that. So, the great mystery, everybody knows what that is? The great mystery? Anybody need me to define it or you're all good? No, what is it? Ah, the great mystery. The great mystery is a word that many Aboriginal people and Indigenous people give to that which we don't know, that which we can't divine, that which we experience in luminous or numinous moments, um, which we have such a hard time trying to put into everyday mental language. We have right now, uh, this afternoon, a, a dear and beloved a sister in our church who's in hospital giving birth, and we're all on tender hooks. Those of us who've given birth are sort of sympathizing for a little labor pain going along with it. And um, those who have given birth, who in this room have given birth, are going, oh yeah, I remember that. Mm hmm That was hard. I mean, unless you're one of those really, really lucky <coughs> people who you know, sneezed and gave birth. <laughs> that, that wasn't my experience. Just let me make it clear with my experience. So the reality is the great mystery would be trying to explain that in terms of someone who's never given birth. Okay, it's hard, it's messy, it's painful, it's long, it's, okay, that doesn't do it, right? So we don't have words, that's why it's a great mystery. We don't know what it is. My seven-year-old granddaughter asked me a few weeks ago, um, how big is the universe? How big is the universe, Grandma? And my answer was, I don't know. we have no idea. We keep thinking we know, only to find out that we don't know, and that what we thought where it might end actually isn't the end at all. So we have absolutely no idea. And so the great mystery is underneath, we have no idea. But we sense that there's something, something way beyond intellect, way beyond senses, hearing, speaking, smelling. Something tells us, something deep inside of us tells us that the great mystery is something. And that every now and again, we touch it, we experience it. We may need it in a dream, in a moment, in nature. But all of a sudden we go, oh, that is a great mystery. Just touching a bit of it. Okay, non-ordinary states of consciousness. Okay. Non-ordinary states of consciousness. We have a little tiny bit of a discussion around consciousness. So consciousness is awareness, it's intention, it possibly likely permeates everything in the uni universe. It's not contained in our brain. Uh, it is possibly permeating throughout our entire being as a human. And it's certainly not restrained to the human experience. 
it more than likely exists in everything. So the non-ordinary state of consciousness, what's that? Okay. Now there's no general definition, why? Because then we have to rely on a definition of a normal state of consciousness. So it becomes tricky. Okay. Let's look at it as a continuum. So it's going to be a little bit kind of Buddhist right now. It's a continuum in which awareness can either expand or contract. And that we're, we're capable of having non-ordinary states of consciousness almost anywhere, almost any time. Although certain situations will make it more likely for us to have a non-ordinary state of consciousness. Now, Non-ordinary states of consciousness are an integral part of the human experience. If we look at older cultures, we're going to see that they have in their culture a non-ordinary state of consciousness. And this could be achieved through meditation, through um, silence, solitude, um, vision quests, um, uh, rituals, rites, um, daily practice. These non-ordinary states of consciousness would be considered normal. This would be considered normal part of human experience. It's only in the modern Western civilization that non-ordinary states of consciousness actually have become pathologized. Okay? So what happened in Western civilization is the, the non, especially the spontaneous non-ordinary states. Now what kind of things can set off those? Anything. Um, getting married, getting divorced, getting a new job. Being in an accident, having a surgery, giving birth is a classic one for a non ordinary state. Falling in love. Every night when you dream, you're in the non ordinary state of consciousness. Right now, most of us are in an ordinary state of consciousness. We're here, we're aware of being here. Ordinary state of consciousness, Dan Groff would describe as the one you drive your car in, and the one you go to work in, where you're doing your job. This will come to his work uh, soon. So there's the ordinary state of consciousness in which we are working in our regular this is me experience. You know what I mean? By this is me, this is me in my regular state. But even in that state, you can have days where we're more energetic or less energetic, we're happier or more sad, where things feel more difficult or not so difficult, where there's influences, could be the weather, could be a fight we had with our fill in the blind boyfriend, mother in law, co worker. So it's a constantly changing experience. There is no normal experience. There's kind of an average every day, this is me. It's constantly like the weather, like everything else around us, constantly changing. The body that you're sitting in today is not the same body you were sitting in. Okay, now I admit to eating a Zeppeli yesterday, so I'm probably like five pounds heavier, but never mind, I'm not talking about that, all right? What I'm talking about is your cells have been changing. Some have died, new cells have been made, everything is changing on a microscopic level. Thoughts, we have approximately 60,000 thoughts every day, 90% of them are the same as yesterday. 10% new thinking. Everything is constantly changing. So our level of consciousness is on a continuum from, let's call it asleep, deeply asleep, non-dreaming. And I'm looking at the healthy states. I don't mean like under anesthetic, having surgery. That's in another category. Right? Or knocked unconscious somewhere, or unconscious from illness or fevers. Those are in a completely different category. So in a regular, healthy, everyday way of being, we have a continuum. Deep, deep sleep, where we have seemingly no consciousness, but something's going on. They can tell by our brainwave patterns. They just don't know yet. It's still in the dream. Then we have our dreaming, our REM sleep, where we're dreaming. This is very definitely a very excellent example of everyday, non-ordinary states of consciousness. And that is an entire lecture we can work out by itself, so we won't go there. But just to say, that that is everybody's experience on a daily basis. Then we have these shifts of awareness and consciousness. 
Everybody in your car started it up. Thought, okay, I'm going to, I don't know, pick a place, your friend's house or school or something or work. And when, all of a sudden you find yourself there and you're not quite sure you don't really remember how you got there. Yeah, this is a pretty common experience. Okay, so what was going on? How conscious were you while you were driving? Some part of you was definitely very conscious, but another part of you was somewhere else, thinking about something, daydreaming, hopefully not talking on your phone. Okay, so we lack it as a norm. Uh, scientific inquiry into non-ordinary states was fizzled out, dismissed, mocked, and most likely something that today those of us in the transpersonal field would call spiritual emergency was pathologized as being mental illness. Intoxication, demonic possession, etc. Now, uh, probably most of you are familiar with these people. Um, being in the last century, uh, really kicked open the new or modern psychology in Western civilization. They opened doors, they furthered a the field of inquiry, they, through their own personal interest in, they brought in and expanded the concepts of a very narrow field. It was very narrow at the time. So William James, everybody familiar with him? He opened the door to the reconsideration of mystical experiences, the peak experience, the mystical experience. Because in his research, what he found was that most people had mystical experiences, and they weren't pathological. And they actually enhanced people's lives. They, they improved people's lives from these, what he called, peak experiences. These moments of joy, or bliss, or freedom, or inner contentment, uh, a sense of connection with nature, with the universe, with the stars, um, with a person, it just improved people's lives. How could that be pathological? If people improve their lives and their understanding of these experiences. So, again, a variety of different researchers and scientists began looking at non-ordinary states of consciousness and what was really helpful was the shift uh, in the 60s through the 70s, which um, I had the pleasure and the joy of being part of East Meets West. And when the Eastern door flew open and what was considered to be a prophecy of uh, 100 years came to pass, which was when the iron bird flies, then, Buddha, then Buddhism will go west. And of course the iron bird was the plane, and through the 50s, the um, ability for people to travel by plane made everything open up so much quicker, more quickly. And that opening brought the meditation and spiritual traditions of the East to meet the science of the West. And out of that meeting, a lot of research came, which confirmed and was able to um, help understand actually what is happening. People become more relaxed, they become more open, they become more calm, they're able to deal with uh, difficult matters better, their health improves. So including these techniques of non-ordinary states of consciousness became a health matter where physical and mental health was being positively influenced by very traditional states of consciousness, mostly in the movements such as yoga and tai chi and those types of practices, which are mystical traditions at their root. Yoga commenced from taking the soma, a long since vanished entheogen, but that's how yoga began. So if we look back, we see a lot of these traditions have very ancient roots in indigenous cultures and practices that through the years developed. So here we have the, the meaning of the East and the West, and they saw that spirituality, creativity, um, social skills, all of these things, general health, all of these things were improving. Now, we move to Abraham Maslow. 
his 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 work made a big difference. And uh, everybody's familiar with some of these people. I highly recommend you read their work if you haven't. states of consciousness, and so these maps were being drawn of human consciousness. So the, the start to understand what is human consciousness, which as we see as we go along, the, the study keeps getting broader. Ken Wilber, anybody familiar with him? He writes Spectrums of Consciousness, and he believes that the mystical traditions of the world have contributed enormously and they provide access to and a knowledge of, of the uh, transcendental reality, of the numinous field, the luminous experiences. Again, we're back to that which we can't quite put into words, that we have difficulty explaining. Anybody here uh, had a mystical experience? Yeah. Peak experience, mystical experience? So m most of you have. This is normal. I would be really concerned if no one put up their hand because it's normal that most people will have them. Often people don't even recognize that they've had one. They'll just think, oh, that moment when I was sitting looking at the waterfall seemed like time stood still. And I just got lost in the sound of the water and the beauty of the light filtering through the mist. And all of a sudden, time passed. I didn't know if it was a minute or if it was a lifetime. Okay, that was a mystical experience. Let so, me move on to the perennial philosophy. Everybody know what that is? Perennial philosophy is the core teachings that exist in all the great spiritual traditions. You can find them in all practices and traditions. Do as you would do. Do as you would be done by. Four core teachings. We're all one, we're all connected. They're everywhere. Peel off the uniforms and the um, you know, man-constructed belief systems and uh, what to eat and what not to eat. Peel all of those things away and you come down to some very clear core principles that can be found. So then Stan Groff. Stan Groff and others formed the new field of transpersonal psychology. And this was an emerging field, and why transpersonal psychology? Trans is beyond the personal. What he and other researchers were finding um, was that the personal experience is one thing, but we are all connected to something much larger than ourselves. And these connections is what the transpersonal uh, movement in psychology calls transpersonal. And so, there's the human experience, the validity of mystical and spiritual experiences, the interconnectedness of self with others, with nature, with community. So here's uh, Dr. Stanislav Grof. Um, he developed a language that is a, li a little easier to work with. He calls them the hylotropic and the holotropic state. The hylotropic being regular everyday living conditions and the holotropic being the non-ordinary state of consciousness. So heightened states of awareness and the thing is is we have these shifts. They can be gradual shifts of heightened states of awareness or they can be very profound. One minute you're in this state and the next minute you're in the astral. And these experiences happen to people. Make, being able to make sense of them without pathologizing them, being able to understand why it might be happening to somebody, supporting them through that kind of uh, development and uh, expanded consciousness experience or a rapid kundalini awakenings, energetic awakenings of the, of the energy body. 
These things are not so uncommon, but if you don't understand what's happening to you, it can be very scary. And so it's good to have these maps, maps of the self and maps of consciousness. Now, both states are fluid. In other words, they're not, uh, you can't put them in a box. Again, we're back to the continuum. They're fluid states. Even something like anesthetic, if you'll notice, anytime anesthetic is used, you have to have an anesthesiologist there. Why? Because you can't give the exact same dose to everybody because everybody reacts differently. What might put somebody out for three hours for the surgery might put somebody out for 15 minutes. So it's a, it's a very interesting study, anesthesiology. There's lots of very interesting stories to be told in that field. So we seek transcendent experiences, and, and there's kind of two, two ways of going at this. There's people who run from them, and there's people who seek them. And um, there's people who scare at them, and if they start happening, they want to shut them down and stop them and control them, and that usually makes things worse. And there's people who are so eager that they're running for them and trying to grab them and, and hold on to them. And, and the Buddha gave a little teaching about this, about attachment and holding on to things. And he says, he was speaking about sadness and happiness. And he said, you know, when sadness comes, we don't like it, so we try to push it away. But the problem is it sticks to our hands. And when happiness comes, we want it so much that we try to grasp it, and it slips through our hands. I'd like you to meditate on that. So the experience of non ordinary states of consciousness, it is beyond mental and theoretical nature. We can't really, other than giving maps, okay, these are called maps, but a map is not the territory. I was sharing earlier, I, I was using a driving program, and it asked me if I wanted parking, and I said yes, and closest parking, yes, and and it directed me turning around a bunch of streets to a parking lot that's not open on Saturday. So there's the map, and then there's the experience. Okay. There's the territory. Okay. I was in the territory, and the map in that moment was not helpful. Now, old maps, do you remember the old maps they used to have, you know, when they thought the world was flat? And they only had partial, like it would include maybe one coast of what we know as North America. And then there used to be a dragon, and there used to be Derby dragons here. Okay, that's the great mystery. They have no idea. And in mythology, the dragon is a, a gate guardian, a guardian of treasure. So it's, we've just expanded. We say, okay, well now we Google's mapped out the entire Earth. Well, probably not. There's I'm sure little pockets here and there that haven't been mapped yet, certainly at the bottom of the ocean, but the thing is, is we've just expanded that. There be dragons here, and it's just been pushed out further. The great mystery is just moved out further. It doesn't mean that it's not there. So, non-ordinary states give us information about ourselves, about the human psyche, ourselves, our life, our being, our, our experience of reality, who we think we are, who we think we need to be, we want to be, what our potential is. About psych consciousness, we learn more about consciousness, about awareness, about being present, about being here, about being now. And the nature of reality, which again is one of those fluid things. What the heck is reality? We have consensual reality. This is a chair. We all agree this is a chair. But what is reality? These are huge questions. So. So in the non-ordinary states of consciousness, in the non-ordinary state of consciousness, it's possible to expand our view of the cosmos, of ourselves, provide an opportunity to, to transform. Now we can't change history, our, our life story, our biography. Okay, so today we're gonna to call our life story our biography. You lived certain experiences. You came here, you incarnated through your mother's body, and everything after that is called your biography. Okay. You can't change, 
can't go back and change the school you went to or the siblings you had or you know it all happened right it's all doesn't exist outside of your memories some photographs it doesn't exist anymore you can't you can't change it but we can change the part of the past that's still alive in the present whatever is still alive inside of us in the moment is something that we can change and we can transform so we can work on our biography, our birth, our karma, our past lives. We can change, we can change the story of our life going forward, and we can change the perspective that we have looking back. Does that make sense? We can change the facts, it's written. But we can change our perspective, our relationship to it. If we're sitting in our life, um, you know, holding on to something that causes us suffering that happened five years, 10 years, 20 years ago, why are we holding on to it? That's the part that's still alive in the present. That's the part that can be changed. Not the event, but our relationship in ourselves to it and to the event and or the person. How do we achieve non your states? Well, in rituals and rites of passages, chanting, singing, dancing, fasting, solitude, throughout the history of the human race, there are lots of uh, examples currently today in practice. Initiation rites, uh, vision quests, as I already mentioned, uh, sacred plants, power plants, teacher plants, all of these have been used for thousands and thousands and thousands of years to help us come to terms with being human and being part of humanity and being here in this reality. Now, any questions on that? So spontaneous non-ordinary states of consciousness. These are, can be precipitated by extraordinary everyday events where we have no idea that something is going to happen, and it happens. And these things can often be happening to very young children. If you read the research on, um, on reincarnation and past lives, there's some researchers that have done extraordinary work. Uh, I happen to like Christopher Bache, B-A-C-H-E, uh, Life Cycles. Uh, uh, Dr. Joel Whitten, Toronto psychiatrist, his work Life Between Lives. Um, there's a lot of a very good body of research out there where people have just done not just theorize about things or tell stories or give opinions, but actually done the research. And this experience of reincarnation can be so profound for, and transpersonal experiences can be so profound for very young children because they haven't quite made that adjustment to this reality. They're still in what we call with our psychological model, the magical years, where Teddy has feelings and, you know, you know what I'm talking about, Santa Claus is real, and the stories that we tell them can seem real to them. And what has become sort of important for us to understand is that a lot of what young children are experiencing is just fantasy and, and, and you know, their ability to play and to uh, create and explore creativity and, and what we can create in our, with our creative little minds and imaginations, but on the other side we have that they might actually be having real experiences that we need to pay attention to. But they are talking about seeing things we don't see, hearing things we don't hear, experiencing things maybe we don't experience, remembering things that we don't remember. Now often because there is no environment around them, either in school or at home or in the kind of local culture, there's no, there has been no sustaining story to, for them to grow into such as other cultures have. In other cultures, particularly more the indigenous or aboriginal cultures, they would be watching, the shamans, the wise woman, the wise man would be watching for the young children who have these experiences. 
because they know they're the future shaman. Because they have a door open, a spiritual door open. And they know that they need to help them understand how to work with that open door. How to work with the fact that they've got, still maybe got one foot in that reality and one foot in this reality. Again, that's a much larger conversation, but just to say spontaneous, non-ordinary states of consciousness can happen. No. I seem to go back instead of forward. Okay, you're good, thank you. Dreaming, daydreaming is a non-ordinary state. Now we need to be careful because in, in dreaming at night is one thing. These are extremely useful experiences that we have. Uh, where our, our unconscious is trying to alert us to things that are happening in our everyday life. So should we talk unconscious at time and time for questions and things, but can we talk about dreaming just a little bit, a few minutes? Okay, thank you. So in, in our dreaming state, uh, researchers indicate that we have anywhere from four, usually five cycles of, of in which we are cycling through different levels of brainwave patterns, consciousness, and awareness. And in what is known as a dream state, okay, REM st uh, state of sleep, where we're actively dreaming, we will usually have four to five cycles of those. And the uh, researchers indicate that in the first dream, we're sort of reprocessing the day's events. In the second dream, we're connecting it with past experiences to make sense of it. In the third kind of stage, we are looking into the future. That's either the third or the fourth dream cycle. We're actually seeing down into the future what's going to come. And, and then in the second or the last, um, second the last or last dream cycle, we're putting the experience into kind of a package that will make sense to us, whereby we will receive the core impression or teaching. Does that make sense? Does that kind of make sense to you? Think about your own dreaming state. Okay. So that's kind of interesting that every night we're making this uh, deep inner exploration of our own psyche, sorting out things from the past. Anybody here, you, you dream about the past? Anybody have dreams about the past? Childhood or being in school? last week in, in university, but, and, and so this is normal, and anybody have dreams that they don't understand? Somebody absolutely no sense in them at all. Okay, pay attention to what you eat before you go to bed, that's a factor too. Alcohol, food, there's all kinds of things that can affect the dreaming state, so the more simple you keep it before you go to bed, the better. So this, what's interesting is we're also kind of having a person that we can potentially have very strong encounters in the dreaming state, in which we encounter other realities. Anybody ever had that experience? Where you encounter other realities, where you wake up and you think, where was I? Was I on another planet, living an entirely different life? Anybody had those dreams where it feels like you lived a completely, total life as a different person, the entire package, and you wake up and you went, what was that? Well, what was that? Was that a past life? Are you connecting into the collective unconscious, plugging into the astral records? You'll know within yourself. So this profound experience we have every night. So before you go to sleep at night, I encourage everybody to meditate and ask your, whoever it is you talk to, above and beyond yourself, your higher self, the universe, the divine, ask them to help you to pay attention to your dreams. Just ask. Help me pay attention to my dreams. Help me remember my dreams. Help me in my dream state to understand where I am and how to go forward. Just a very simple, open-ended, not too tight. Okay, you know what I mean, not too tight. Very simple, open-ended inquiry. And over time, you might find some very interesting things happen. So, as we know, in shamanic states, um, those of you who may have participated in different shamanic rituals or read about or studied, perhaps, uh, will find that it is often in shamanic uh, 
rituals that it is only the shaman who enters into the non-ordinary state. That the medicine man, woman, or shaman is the one who enters into the non-ordinary state to serve the community. That they will go into that state to receive wisdom or divination, information about which plants to help for healing or which direction to give. In other situations, it is um, a group ritual experience where the group is participating in the ritual fully. And um, all provide full opportunity. Now, this is an interesting piece here. Some theorists propose that sacred plants might be a factor in the formation of some of the world's main religions. That again is a is a pretty well researched and um, interesting field of looking at the roots of many of the main religions and how they developed and what they and spiritual traditions and practices and, and how they evolved and the way that they evolved. Okay, where are we? A couple more pages and then we're going to stop for some questions and a break. All right. So, what are the optimum conditions for a non-ordinary state of consciousness? The first would be a ritual setting. And this again is, is you know, some of you may meditate. So you go to your center, your meditation center, and you enter into silence, and you sit on a cushion on the floor, or you, perhaps you sit in chairs, or however your center is organized. There's silence, or there's chanting. There's maybe a teacher who gives some instructions or directions for your meditation, and then you're all meditating. So you're in a, in a ritual setting, and you are together working in an ordinary state of consciousness. And there are many, many different types of rituals. Those that include um, trance singing, trance dancing. If we look at the, um, the uh, Aboriginal people of uh, North America, we see that they have Specific, specific dances, the sun dance, the, the sun moon dance, uh, where they would be dancing for days. Okay, it's not possible to not go into a non-ordinary state. So fasting, sensory deprivation, vision quests, all, all of these rituals. The authentic presence of qualified individuals is usually a very important factor for non-ordinary states of consciousness. So you have the guide in holotropic breathwork, for example, the work of Dr. Stanislav Grof, you have the facilitator or facilitators, you have the shaman or shamaness, you have the, uh, in, in our practices, it's the madrina or the padrino, you have the people who are guiding the ritual and holding the space and who know the ritual, they know the um, sacred territory that they are working in. So if you go to a sweat lodge, then you know uh, if you're working, if you're going to a sweat lodge that has been prepared by a true sweat lodge master, okay, then you know that that individual knows exactly how to prepare the ritual, how to prepare him or herself for the ritual, how to prepare the people for the ritual, how to take care of the people during the ritual, how to provide the correct teachings at the right moments in the ritual, and then how to bring everybody back at the end of the ritual. It's sort of like flying a plane. You know, flying a plane requires a pilot. You'd like to think that the, if you're getting on a plane that the pilot is certified, trained, experienced, sober. Okay. Important things. Right? And then you get on the plane and you trust, you're going to land where you're flying to. Now, sometimes in the non-ordinary non states, especially ones we may seek out ourselves, we may have what we call a difficult passage, a difficult experience. Some of these things can be painful. We can be sitting and meditating and weeping. The Dalai Lama once said that if you haven't if you haven't wept in meditation, if you haven't grieved your life, you have not begun to meditate yet. Everybody thinks meditation is sort of sitting peacefully, chakras open. No, actually meditation is awareness, awareness, awareness. And usually the first awarenesses are, can be very including of difficult things. 
It can also be joyful discoveries and creative discoveries and peaceful discoveries, but we have to be open to all of it. So acceptance that the state will provide benefit, even if it's difficult. And trusting that an inner healer and wisdom will also be guiding. And this is a really key piece. It's not just the person who's holding the space or creating the ritual or managing the sweat lodge or the sun dance or the meditation. Uh, that it is actually that there's something inside every single one of you and me in this room that we can call the inner healer or inner wisdom or something, whatever words you're comfortable with, and that is what will guide you in the healing. That is what will lead the healing process. A willingness to surrender to the experience. So a willingness to go with it. Even if it's uncomfortable or scary, a willingness to go with it. Trusting that something of great benefit will be learned or experienced, again, even if it's difficult or scary, and allowing the possibility for anything to arise. Staying very open, uh, open-minded, open-hearted, again, even if that feels difficult, and even if you have to ask for help. Asking for help is good. Whether we ask it for a physical person who's with us, or, or the person teaching, we ask for help, or we ask inside for help. We ask our guides, we ask spirit, we ask the great mystery, we ask the divine, we ask for help. No one should ever feel shy to ask for help when you need help. This is actually maturity. Knowing when you need help and asking for it is actually a sign of maturity. Okay, so we are going to pause here and have time for some questions and then Take a little break so that we can stretch around. So, questions? Yes? I have one question. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I have a question. I guess you're going to guess like, with your specific system, um, what are the specific states of unordinary consciousness and when is there a qualitative, thing qualitative? that would tell us when we're entering into a state of down ordinary consciousness, specifically like if they're that bad of Buddhism, for instance, they have a sutra with like state specific things. And also in your system, is there specific ways for working with not an ordinary state of consciousness where they're about Buddhism it's like meditate, don't attach to any of it because it's all samsara anyway. But so like I'm wondering, yeah, are there qualitative steps and states in your system and how would your system work with these states? Okay, so I think if I understand the question correctly is, are there levels or steps in non-ordinary states? Well, in this, your, your perspective, yeah. In, in my perception. And, uh, and how do you work with them? Yeah. And how do you work with them? Well, um, there's, there's many people who've tried to map out that. You know, that there's seven, that there's 13, okay? Um, if you go hunting, you'll see that a lot of people have, have tried to name all these different levels of heightened states of awareness and increased states of awareness and altered states of awareness, and et cetera, and all the way up. And the bottom line is the more maps we have, it can be useful, but when it comes to these things, the experience is better. Okay. Um, I'm a swimmer. I love the ocean, I love water. And I also have for a while, but I'm a scuba diver. I love diving. And it, for me, it's like trying to explain to somebody who's never seen the ocean, somebody who's um, lived in the desert their whole life. So for them, water is something, is a small quantity, it's scarce, you have to look for it, you guard it. And then to try and explain the ocean as an experience is really, really difficult. So trying to explain non-ordinary states of consciousness is very, very difficult because um, there's many techniques, okay, techniques of the sacred, let's call them that. In sacred traditions, there are many, many, you can go to many different meditation teachers, they're going to each have a different technique. 
One's going to tell you to sit this way. Another one's going to give you a mantra. Another one's going to say, hold your hands that way. Another one's going to tell you to work with your breath. Another one's going to say you have to do this for six months and then come back and see me. Now, all of those things will be useful. They'll be useful if you practice them. But the bottom line is, can you trust something inside of yourself that that non-ordinary state is already right here, just waiting to happen? and that each one of you will experience it as you open to it because it's simply a question of awareness. Now for people who wish to or who feel called to journey further in those, then people will, as I said before, seek out opportunities. Probably one of the safest and um, best experiences would be the work of Dr. Stan Groff called the Holotropic Breathwork. Um, I had the privilege of training with Dr. Stan Groff. I happen to love his work, and I highly recommend it. It provides a very simple technique for quite quickly entering into a non-ordinary state of consciousness and in a very safe and supportive environment. And most people, I remember in my first breath work, workshop in 19, I don't know, early 90s, 91, 92, something like that, before I, just before I joined the training. And we were 130 people, let's say, in a room, broken down into sitters and breathers with all the facilitators. And I had my experiences. It was, it was very deep and profound. And at the, at the end of the day, in the evening, there was a talk that uh, Dr. Groff gave and he said, well, you know, hands up, anybody who had like an experience, you know, and like 95% of the hands went up. How many people had an experience of their birth? About 70% of the hands went up. So what, what he was trying to teach us is that's how close to the surface it is. It is so close to the surface. After a number of years of, of working and training in non-ordinary states of consciousness through my lifetime in various and different ways, it became so obvious to me that we are walking around with highly charged body memories every day. And they're right under the surface. And, and even the most, you know, the simplest of reactions can happen. The most simple of reactions can happen to what is inside of us that can quickly bring it right out. Now we can either work with these things consciously and bring them to transformation and, and personal liberation and personal growth. Right. That's our choice. Or we can try and block them back down and get scared of them and stop them and pathologize them, which leads to more discomfort and inner tension. So these experiences can be right under the surface, and they're ours. They belong to us, even if something outside of us triggers them. So you say, how do you enter into them? And how do you go through those levels? That again is, I wish I had a more concrete answer for you. I just don't. Um, another example I can give you is when I was in the training, there was this wonderful man with a great sense of humor. And um, after being in the training for two years, he said, you know, there's something I want to share. He says, I've been in the training for two years now. Every module I'm here, I do all the breath work, everything I'm supposed to be doing. He says, I haven't had a vision, a teaching, a, an experience, a nothing. He says, I, I lie down, I breathe as I'm supposed to breathe, and I go into this state that Stan tells me is possibly like, let's call the yogic sleep state. He says, and at first I thought, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Other people are going through their birth and their past lives and shamanic initiations and all these stories and everything, and all I'm doing is going to this sort of suspended state. And he says, but I want to tell you, my entire life has changed. How I am in my everyday life is different. It's different. How I am with my family, how I am at work, how I am with nature is completely different. So he says, so I don't really know what's happening to me when I'm up there doing nothing. All I know is I see the benefit. 
So we need to be careful that we don't start attaching expectations to the non-ordinary state. Because we can't dial it up. We can't say, okay, I want to experience past life. Or I want to relive my birth or something. We can't dial it up. All we can do is trust that there's something inside of us that will be directing the process and that will take us where we need to go and that healing and good things can come from that if we work with it with consciousness. I hope I even made a small attempt at a answering your question. You did a good job. I just want to ask the question to just hear your answer so that I can answer. <laughs> okay, take. <laughs> Another question? Any other questions? Yes. Um, after having some peak experiences myself, both induced through meditation practice and other means like uh, medicine, um, I've had conversations with people who have been able to express that they have seen almost identical places um, or uh, objects or beings or just having really, really similar experiences in down to great details. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm wondering what your, your thoughts are on um, why we're seeing some of the same things and if this is sort of like a constant uh, place that exists that we're just not able to see unless we're in that state or is that a part of the collective unconscious? For example, a lot of these things can be described in sacred texts. Um, so when you have a peak experience like that, I can only speak for myself, but I got excited. And I went, oh, wow, what is that? And start to do my research. And you see that this has been happening, not just me and my buddies, but like for thousands of years, very similar places. Can you speak to that at all? Sure. The answer to all of it is yes. <laughs> so, but I'll say a little bit more than that. Um, Stan Groff tells a wonderful story about himself. Um, when he and his brother Paul Groff, both psychiatrists in Czechoslovakia in Prague um, in the 50s, they're sent a box of LSD 25, the original. Um, Albert Hoffman had done his testing and exploration with it, you'd shift it off to a number of different psychiatric units, saying, I don't quite know what this is, but I think that it may have some value in psychiatry, so let me know. And so being good research scientists, um, Stan asked Paul to be his sitter, to sit with him while he took this LSD-25. At the end of the experience, Stan says that in that moment he knew that he only had two choices. He either had to completely throw away his model of reality or never take that substance again. Because that substance had showed him a completely different reality. That when he went looking, and if you're familiar with his work, and I highly recommend his books, they're outstanding for maps, okay? He said what he found was not that this was a new place. He says what he experienced had been described in many different words with different images by countless spiritual traditions and cultures throughout <coughs> millennia and millennia, if not as far back as rock art, okay, and cave art. So is the non-ordinary state giving access to places in the collective unconscious? I believe so. Are we able to connect with archetypal beings and archetypal experiences? I believe so. That is also my experience. It's the experience of, it's over 40 years I've been working in non-ordinary states of consciousness. Thousands and thousands and thousands of breathwork uh, participants and clients and students and and 23 years drinking and serving the daimi, Santo Daimi, I can say without question and doubt that yes. Now, you're asking me the reality of that. Then we're back to trying to define reality, which modern physics says we need to be a little bit careful trying to define it, because even Einstein's space-time 
theory of his theory of space time even all of those things that we thought were foundations the more we discover we see that they're important parts but maybe not the whole picture so our concept of reality is constantly shifting uh, you might also apart from the work of Stan Groff you might also find uh, Michael Talbot's The Holographic Universe. Yeah, you remember to keep track of. Because somebody's going to ask me afterwards, do you have a list of all of the books and the authors you mentioned? And unless someone actually does it, then I, I won't. Any more questions? We have time to leave me a question. Yeah. Uh, you had your hand up first. Uh, I was going to ask for that list. Louder. You're just going to ask for the list of books. You're going to ask for the list of books. Okay. Well, hopefully someone's on it, and uh, we'll have a discussion. Yes? Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit your take on non-ordinary states of consciousness and awakening, or non-dual state, as uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness being different experiences other than we're accustomed to experiencing normally and then an awakening experience as a non-dual state. And even after an awakening experience, uh, is there an evolution in unordinary states of consciousness? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, awakening comes from a non-ordinary state. It, an awakening happens in a non-ordinary state of consciousness. That is one of the non-ordinary states. It's the awakening, awakened state. Now, um, I'm, uh, again, another great teacher of mine is Jack Cornfield, and I am particularly um, enjoy his model. He does not believe there is enlightenment, that enlightenment is not a place of arrival, that there's no such thing. There is only enlightened activity. So it's being here now in this moment and being enlightened now. It's being enlightened driving my car going home. It's being enlightened when someone cuts me off in my car driving home. Okay? So it's enlightened activity. You know, there was a huge push um, through the, you know, wonderful 70s, and I'm, I'm a child of that era, um, a wonderful push for enlightenment. Everybody was looking for enlightenment. And I think Ram Dass's book, Be Here Now, really spoke to that well, about being here now, and that enlightenment is not a place of arrival. Unfortunately, there are some teachings that talk about enlightenment as being a place of arrival, without including this part of it being the moment-by-moment -moment enlightened activity. So we can we can reach a place of where we feel an awakening state, an enlightened state. Um, I'll tell another story. Um, I think these are also Jack Cornfield's stories um, about what happened to Mara after his encounter, after Buddha encountered Mara. Everybody knows who I'm talking about, Buddha, right? Everybody, I don't have to explain who Buddha is, right? Mara was the difficult being who came to um, challenge him in his moment of his enlightenment. And so here's the Buddha sitting meditating under the tree. And, and Mara comes along, and he comes along in all kinds of difficult disguises. First he's tempting. There's all this wonderful food, and then there's all these beautiful women, and each time the Buddha says, this is an illusion, this is an illusion, this is an illusion. Until finally Mara shows up as this very scary, demonic being. And Buddha says, you two are illusion. And then Mara says, oh, okay, you passed him, takes off. So what happens next? Here's the Buddha, enlightened. What happens next? So there's a couple of different stories, and, and two of my favorites are that Buddha and Mara become friends. And, and Mara will often stop by and have tea uh, with, with the Buddha, and visit, and share stories, and what's new, and what's going on for you. And they'll both complain. And Mara will say, oh, it's hard being me because everybody's scared of me and everybody hates me and doesn't like me. And, and the Buddha says, oh, I disagree. I think it's harder being me because I have to be enlightened all the time. <laughs> My other, the other story that I like is that um, the Buddha goes on through life, but that any time he felt challenge or temptation, 
temptation being something, not a list of things that anybody wrote, because I think this is very individual. Okay. But any time he felt a challenge of some kind, he would stop and he would say, oh, is that you, my old friend Mara? Mm -hmm. Recognizing the moment to lose or hold on to enlightened activity. Now this is not easy. This is not easy. This is a lifetime effort in which um, the wiser teachers through the last half of the second, uh, the ones I had the good fortune to train with and spend time with, would say, this is the language you used then. I don't know if it's popular today still, but we would talk about being in our stream of consciousness. I hope this vocabulary comes back because it was really accurate for that time and those experiences. And moving in the stream of your consciousness, you become aware that you get it and you lose it, and you get it and you lose it. And so we spend a lifetime of re-getting it, only to know that the next minute we can lose it. One more story and then there'll be another question. So there's um, a young man studying, and he studies many years with his meditation trainer. Let's make him a Zen trainer his uh, Zen Buddhist teacher, and he's come to the point where he thinks he's ready to ask. He wants to go up the ladder. He's become a little spiritually ambitious. He wants to go up the ladder. So he's ready to ask his teacher, am I ready to go to your teacher? Because that's how things progress. He's trained with somebody until you're ready to go to their teacher, you see. So it happened to be raining that day, and he was so thinking of this imminent question in this meeting with his teacher. So he goes in and he sits down and he puts his request forward. And his teacher looks at him and he smiles and he says, on which side of your shoes did you put your umbrella? Couldn't answer. He spent another 11 years with that teacher. <laughs> One more question and then we'll take a break. We'll you had your hand up before. Thank you for such a great talk. Um, I had a question about something that you were saying before. I was wondering if you can speak to the uh, Western fetishization with the shaman uh, as the you know primordial and supreme healer. And the second part to that is how does this map onto our perceptions of our own inner wisdom? I'm not sure if I clearly got the first part of your question. You're talking about the shamans. Yes. Say again your question. The question is, uh, the is regarding the Western fetishization of the shaman. Okay. So I'm um, thinking of spiritual tourism. Oh, okay. That's yeah. what you. That's the direction you're going. Okay. Yes. I, I get yes. it better now. Okay. okay. So, in particular, ayahuasca tourism. Yes. This is a real yes. problem. Yes. Um, well, we all we have to do is look at our culture, Western civilization. You know, we don't. We have such a distorted idea of of wisdom. We've gotten rid of all our elders. We don't honor the stages of life in a way that the human race did for thousands or tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of years. Older people are put away, they're, um, they're eliminated from their work, uh, especially in certain, you know, get a few wrinkles, boy, you're off the, you're out of the fashion industry or, or the magazine industry, or the PR or something. So aging is not equated with wisdom and experience in our culture. It's equated with getting old, <laughs> which we are getting old. Okay. But it's usually in other traditions, it's about gaining wisdom and experience that we then are able to pass on to younger generations. We share how to track that particular animal so we know where it's going. We share how the wind moves and the seasons come and go. We share how to do a certain kind of carving or weaving or how to make those clothes or whatever it is that we're doing. We share that. Our culture has changed so quickly and so vastly that we don't have that as a role model. We don't have adolescent rituals. We don't help our children go into, we have sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's what we've got for adolescent rituals. We don't have a proper ritual for children going into, you know, we have remnants in some tradition. You know, 
First Communion in some of the Christian traditions. We'll have the Bat Mitzvah and Bar Mitzvah in the Jewish traditions, but it doesn't, it's not recognizable as a party where you say some scriptures and pin money to somebody's coat. It doesn't look like something that would have happened you know, centuries ago, where it was a true initiation into adulthood. So we're missing that. So people are seeking, our culture is seeking spiritual experience spiritual recognition, um, recognition of the self as a being that is part of society, culture, and humanity. And it is looking and searching for meaningful ritual and rites of passage. So in that search, a lot of people are grasping for what's out there, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, um, it doesn't always work out so well, because you will always have people who will see the need and find a way to meet it in a way that gives them power and or money or both uh, without actually offering what is truly needed. So it is a problem. It's something that our center uh, does what we can to try and educate people about and, um, and for the future will continue to do that, to try and educate people about this. And, um, other than education, I don't, and, and trying in our culture to provide meaningful mm -hmm. uh, life passage information and ritual, and helping people create rituals. Mm -hmm. If the old rituals don't fit, because that happens too, some old rituals just don't fit. You know, if we look here locally, Quebec was a Catholic state run by a, a rather you know, and I give the greatest of respect to all of the religions, that when a religion becomes too controlling of its people, then it's always going to create a problem. Can we agree on that? If a religion starts telling people too much who they have to vote for and, you know, li li get in their houses and tell them how to live their lives too tightly, then I, that's a bit of a problem that society will rebel against. Does it make sense what I'm saying? So how does how do we evolve rituals so that they have meaning in today's world and in our culture? Did I answer your question even a little bit? Yes, absolutely. So we're going to take a little break.